I really just have one question as I read our passage this morning from the Gospel of John. What on earth was Nathaniel doing underneath that fig tree? Because whatever it was, it seems to have been really important. I mean, the simple fact that Jesus saw Nathaniel there under the tree and was able to deduce simply from that sight something essential about the, the character of Nathaniel. Why, that blew Nathaniel away. It led him to make a, an extraordinary confession, one of the most extraordinary confessions in the Gospels about who Jesus was. He declared that Jesus was both the Son of God and the King of Israel. And what's more, but and more than Nathaniel's response, I'm curious about what it was that Jesus saw in Nathaniel and what he was doing there. Because whatever it was, it revealed Nathaniel to be truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And that word, that word that's translated deceit, also has a sense of, of cunningness, of wiliness. So it doesn't just mean a tendency to lie, but also a tendency to manipulate the truth in self-serving ways. The old uh, King James Version translated this verse as an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And that is a pretty good translation, or at least it would be if people still used words like guile. And let me tell you something. I'm getting pretty tired of guile and deceit. I'm getting tired of people who use guile to hold on to their power or wealth. I am tired of leaders who have decided that the people's perception of truth is more important than the actual truth. I am tired of political leaders who are like Eli in our Old Testament reading, who knows full well that the people underneath him are breaking the rules, are doing things like taking trips that no one else is allowed to take, or profiting from their positions, or abusing people, and yet are content to put forward the convenient fiction that they're not aware. I'm tired of of promises that people make and have no intention to fulfill. It seems we're living in a world where guile and deceit have been elevated to a science, and I am getting very tired of it. So wouldn't it be helpful? <laughs> wouldn't it be so helpful if we had some way of just looking at someone while they sat underneath a fig tree and being able to know that here, here, is a person in whom there is no guile, no deceit. Why, instead of carrying out job interviews or political debates, we could just make people sit under a tree for a bit and, and we would just know <laughs> that here, here is somebody who has the integrity and honesty we are looking for. I mean, think of the incredible benefits of such a straightforward test. Now, I know there are some who would say this could not work for ordinary people. I mean, sure, Jesus might be able to discern something about the character of Nathaniel by seeing him under a fig tree, but that's Jesus. Jesus, as Nathaniel himself confesses, is the Son of God. Surely Jesus can see things that other mere human beings cannot. But you know what Jesus himself says? that there's nothing extraordinary about what he saw, which suggests that what he saw was actually visible to anybody. So, what was Nathaniel doing underneath that tree? There is one possibility that comes to us from the traditions of rabbinic Judaism, who, of course, developed strong traditions around the study of the Torah or that is to say, the law of what we would call the Old Testament. In rabbinic Judaism, there's this strong tradition of people, traditionally men, gathering to discuss the Torah. They read the scriptures and get into these extended discussions and arguments about the meaning and the application of the passages. These sorts of discussions often become extremely contentious, so much so, that it has become a proverb to say that 
where there are two Jews, there are three opinions. But this is actually not seen in a negative way, but it's as a, seen as a way of engaging with the text by re wrestling with a variety of opinions. And it is believed <coughs> that deeper th truth can be found by engaging in this kind of contentious discussion. And what's more, it is seen to be a great blessing to be able to engage in such an activity. As you might recall, Tevye sings in Fiddler on the Roof. <clears throat> if I were rich, I'd have the time that I lack to sit in the synagogue and pray, and maybe have a seat by the eastern wall. And I'd discuss the holy books with the learned men several hours every day. That would be the sweetest thing of all. So this way of studying the Torah is, is a long-standing, most beloved Jewish tradition. And apparently, at some point in the Middle Ages, this activity was referred to using a rather odd phrase. It was called sitting under the fig tree. And so it has been suggested by some that that's what Nathaniel was doing, that he was studying the Torah when Jesus saw him. And there's much to be said for that interpretation. That is indeed the kind of in activity that might indicate something about Nathaniel's character. But... <laughs> There is just one problem. There are no indications that that kind of activity was part of the common Jewish life in the time of Jesus. The study of the Torah was only more popularly and widely practiced after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. While the temple still existed, the temple was the focus of Jewish life instead of the scriptures. And the scriptures could only be read by a few because literacy was low and even fewer could possibly obtain a very expensive copy of the scriptures. So it's highly unlikely that Nathaniel was engaging in that specific activity, at least not as it was later practiced. But still, I think there might be some connection here. Where, after all, did this figure of speech, this idea that, that studying the Torah was like sitting underneath a fig tree, where did that come from? It must have come from the scriptures themselves, specifically from a promise that is repeated a few times in the Old Testament. The promise goes like this. They shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. In many ways, that verse contains one of the key promises of the Old Testament. For it envisions a nation where every family has their own piece of land. And every family has one of these iconic fruit trees that, were a common, that are common in that part of the world. So it envisions an agricultural society where everyone has the basics of survival. And I know, I understand that may not quite sound like utopia to us. Because we would probably look more for more than just the basics of life. But maybe that just shows you how tough life was for them if their big dream was just to be able to have their own vine and their own fig tree. You know how we sometimes talk about the American dream? Well, that was kind of like the Israelite dream. And a big part of that dream apparently was, was being able to have just a little bit of leisure time where you're able to sit down under your own fig trees for a little while. And that is, of course, why that later expression came to be used for the discussion of the Torah. When in later ages, Jewish men became prosperous enough to have a little bit of leisure time, they, like Tevye, 
decided that the best way for them to use that time was to spend it discussing the Torah. But like I say, that was all in the future. What might it have looked like in Jesus' day when literacy was rare and Torah scrolls were even rarer? Well, I would suggest to you that before people argued over the written words of the Torah, they struggled with living it and living out its promises. In Nathaniel's day, that basic Israelite dream of every Israelite family having their own vine and their own fig tree to live under had become out of reach for huge numbers of people. They had lost their family farms and their vines and their fig trees. Huge numbers of people had become consigned to living as slaves or to getting by by working as day laborers. So maybe what Jesus had seen was, was Nathaniel trying to keep that ancient Israelite dream alive. It's actually very interesting that Jesus refers to Nathaniel as an Israelite. Do you realize that that word is very rarely used in the New Testament? In fact, it only appears twice. The word Israelite had become out of date in Jesus' time. Kind of like the dream of everyone having their own vine and their own fig tree had gone out of date. In Jesus' day, the normal word that people would have used would have been Judean or Galilean. That is to say, they had begun to call themselves what the Romans called them. But Jesus sees Nathaniel as an Israelite underneath his own fig tree. So Nathaniel, I suspect, was doing what he could to keep the dream alive. He was reminding people of God's promise that they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees and that no one shall make them afraid. Clearly, Nathaniel's not just looking out for himself and his own fig tree, but he's shouting out to all who will listen of God's intention and plan for every family to be able to have what they need. He is demanding what God has been demanding. And he's demanding it for everyone. Nathaniel clearly seems to have been someone who dis didn't hesitate to say what was on his mind. You know, when, when Philip told him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth, Nathaniel snapped back. Huh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Those words weren't polite. They were not the words of someone who lets the worry that he might offend someone get in the way of speaking what is on his mind. Nathaniel spoke the truth as he saw it. And so when he saw all of the ways in which the nation no longer functioned as God intended, you can bet that Nathaniel didn't stop to calculate how dangerous it would be for him to speak up about it. He spoke up. And when, when Jesus saw him, that's what he was referring to when he said he saw Nathaniel underneath the fig tree. But if we can understand that, are we any closer to finding some secret method to discover the individuals among us, especially the leaders and potential leaders who are people without guile and deceit? I mean, Sure, this is not likely ever to be something easy to discern. The human heart is ever creative at finding new ways to deceive. But I believe that one thing we can do is to be on the lookout for those who remind us of the character of Nathaniel in this passage. We need, first of all, someone who believes in the promises of God. That is to say, Someone who has not given in to the cynicism of this world. Someone who has not stopped believing, even if it seems unlikely for now, that there will be vines and fig trees for all, and that God can make it happen. We need people, clearly with that kind of faith, that lack of cynicism. And we also need Nathaniels 
who are not just in it for themselves, not just in it for their own fig tree, but who are willing to hold out for the sake of the whole community to have what they need to survive. We are so much in need of that these days. And yes, yes, we need Nathaniels who are not afraid to speak up and share the truth as they see it. No matter what the cost, to speak the inconvenient truth. We need Nathaniels. And the truth of the matter is that we can't just wait around for one to show up. We need to be looking underneath the fig trees of this world. We need uh, to, and that means we need to start spending time under the fig trees ourselves. Because that's how Jesus found a kindred spirit in Nathaniel. I suspect he was doing the same thing. You need to, to be a Nathaniel to find a Nathaniel. Let's pray. Lord God, we are weighed down by those who live by guile and deceit. And we pray that you would send us leaders and people like Nathaniel, help us to recognize them, help us to trust them and move forward together. Help us to be them. That's got to be the first step. Amen.